This is the Paracay Podcast, proudly brought to you by major sponsor Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club, Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty, Bo Cook from Loan Market, BTZD, the official apparel partner of the Paracay Podcast, and the Parramatta Times, the official media partner of the Paracay Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Paracave Podcast. And now over to your host, Troy Warner, broadcasting live from the world famous Paracave. And yes, hello and welcome back to another cracking episode of the Paracave Podcast. My name is Troy Warner, and this is a very special episode as it is episode number 200 of the podcast. Can you believe it? Time has flown past, episodes have come and go, it's amazing what episode number you can get up to once you do start doing some more content each week, and uh, it was only yesterday I thought it was 150 and 100, but now we've hit 200, and today's guest is the Interview Style Podcast, and he is a very special guest, I was privileged enough to chat to this guest uh he doesn't give very many media interviews and i really appreciate his time for me to have a chat about his career in rugby league now he is one of the greatest coaches in rugby league unfortunately not to win a premiership but has coached over 600 games in the uh, rugby league first grade over in england and in the uh, NRL and also previous to the NRL as well. Uh, And he also, maybe not many people may know this, but he also played first grade as well for St George and South Sydney, which we also talk a little bit about in the interview. Now, he coached uh, such teams as the Illawarra Steelers, Hull FC and Bradford Bulls over in England, St George Dragons, Parramatta Eels, Newcastle Knights and the Sydney Roosters. Now he took the Dragons to the 1992 and 93 Grand Finals against the Brisbane Broncos. Unfortunately went down to Wayne Bennett and the Broncos. He also took the Parramatta Eels to the 2001 Grand Final against Newcastle uh, which unfortunately Parramatta lost that one as well. And the Sydney Roosters as well to the 2010 Grand Final as well against the Dragons. So certainly one of the greatest coaches of rugby league, never to win a premiership, but certainly in my eyes turned around the Parramatta Eels from where they were in 1997 to where they ended up where he finished his coaching career there in 2006 and of course I am talking about Mr Brian Smith now during the chat with Brian we talk about obviously his playing career his short playing career uh, that many people may not know Uh, that he did play first grade rugby league, Uh, but then also his coaching career as well at those clubs that I mentioned. And with probably a little bit uh, more emphasis on the Parramatta Eels when he was there as well. So, look, a really good chat. I thought it was anyway. I know you will enjoy it as well. And... Uh, As I said, I really appreciate Brian for giving me his time. It took a while to get there, but we got there, and I've been urging, I've been wanting to give you this episode for a long time now. Uh, It's been, it was recorded a few weeks ago now, uh, but I've had it on the back burner to make it the special 200th episode of the podcast. So, and. This would not be at all possible without the help of the sponsors. You heard them at the top of the show. 
Major sponsor, Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club. Bo Cook from Loan Market. Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty. BTZD Teamwear, the official apparel sponsor of the Paracay Podcast. And the Parramatta Times, the official media partner of the podcast. So more details about the sponsors and the podcast merchandise which you can purchase after the show after the chat with brian because you don't want to hear me anymore you want to get into this chat i want to deliver it to you so stay tuned for that info after this chat with brian smith so enough of me talking and as hindy says get a beer coffee whatever you want sit back relax and enjoy and let's get straight into it G'day, it's uh, Brian Smith here, former NRL coach, uh, coming to you by Paracave podcast. And as you just heard from his intro, my guest today on the Paracave podcast is a very special guest as he coached the club that I love, the Parramatta Eels, but also coached over in England as well and also for a few other NRL clubs in Australia, the St George Dragons, the Newcastle Knights and the Sydney Roosters. And as I said, it's an honour to and a privilege to have this man on, as I know he doesn't do very many interviews. Uh, so welcome to the Paracave podcast, Mr. Brian Smith. Good on you, Troy. Thanks very much. Not a problem. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, uh, going back uh, in the early days, did Rugby League find you or did you find Rugby League? Um, I grew up on the north coast in New South Wales and my my dad was um, uh, a player and uh, was involved with the lower clearance um, uh, rugby league team in those days way back in the in the 1950s and I, I was a, a child and I yeah. think uh, I got thrown around in the, the bus when the team traveled or Around and uh, my dad, <clears throat> my dad was just a, you know, just a player in the local competition, and but he, uh, you know, he had a real love for the game, which he shared with me and and my brothers, and uh, we we all grew up with, you know, footy uh, was our our main thing. Most of the time, uh, I think, um, you know, was my my spare time was trying to convince my my brother and my sister to come and kick the ball and play with me yeah. out in the we were on a farm <laughs> lived on a farm and we uh, you know didn't get to play a proper game of footy till I went to high school when I was 12 yeah and and then um, whilst most people know you as a as a first grade coach you actually played first grade as well for St George and also South Sydney uh, what were your playing days like um Oh, I was pretty lucky to. My parents moved. Uh, we, we moved to a, a north coast town of, of Casino in my uh, early teens, and Casino was like a hub of rugby league in those days. I'd won the Clayton Cup a couple of times, I think, and yeah. the junior league was fantastic. So I got uh, to get a you know pretty good education and a, an outlet for my you know for my love for the game, I guess. But I um, eventually uh, I was captain of New South Wales schoolboys in uh, okay. back in the day, and that sort of gave me a, a an intro- introduction to when I went to Sydney uh, when I finished high school. I uh, went and had a trial game with the St George Dragons, and I had a couple of years there playing, and then a couple of years at uh, South. Now, whilst playing was coaching on the radar for yourself was that a path that you thought you would go down oh not really I, I, at that 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 age i i really enjoyed being i was captain i played halfback so yep. you know i was captain of a lot of the teams that i played in and i um i enjoyed that sort of um um you know whatever it comes with being a captain in those days of schoolboy teams Reserve grade teams mainly, and um, uh, but you know my my love for or my opportunity to 
to get into coaching came when I became a physical education teacher and yeah. I spent nine years at James Cook Boys High, High School at Colgra, which sort of gave me that outlet again to, I found, you know, that by, by uh, the middle of that term, I guess I'd worked out I wasn't going to be a, a you know, a permanent top level first grade player, but, but coaching was really uh, my thing, and I, okay. I fell in love with that. Really, that was my my um, in there at uh, via physical education teaching, and then I sort of kicked on from that. Yeah, well, your first first grade coaching job was at the Illawarra Steelers, and what was it like coaching a young club as they were only two years into the competition at that stage? <laughs> Yeah, that was um, I made. I was just full of bravado and and um, you know just uh, the opportunity was was just um, it sort of encaptured me. I was just besotted by it. Yeah. I was I, I just really um, you know the Illawarra Steelers were very uh, much on a sh- run on a shoestring. Yeah. You know, there was no finance and it was um, a very tough time. And, you know, I, I really worked out you know, how hard, how difficult coaching is, but I somehow or other I survived it all. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, 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 I very quickly learned how to, you know, um, it, it's a battle to survive. In, in coaching, it's, it's such a, a deadly business and trying to find ways to win just um, made me realise what how little I knew about the game itself, how to coach it. And, um, you know, I, I quickly found out that I, I needed to get a, a full-on education on all of the, the things that go with coaching. So there was no real outlet then for or opportunities for a great deal of sort of educational processes about coaching. So I just had to, you know, find other ways. With um, I became a real student of um, American football okay. and American sports. I travelled there and went went to America probably eight or ten times. And yeah. and then um, you know sort of listened and learned from some of the more senior coaches that were in. Um, Involved in the um, old New South Wales rugby league competition, okay. and yep. you know, just uh, I, I had I had to educate myself if I was going to survive in the in that business. Is it true when you were at Illawarra that you actually proposed using two referees in the game? Yep. Yeah, uh, and that didn't eventuate until two thousand and nine. <laughs> uh, do you yeah, think you, can, do you, you think, can tell how much notice they took of me, mate? <laughs> do you think maybe uh, in today's game that it should go back to two referees? Oh, there's some games when I think it it should, but you know, it's um, they probably found better ways of um, you know with technology and with uh, uh, I, I think I'm right in saying that. Um, when I watch uh, games now, not not all that often, but it seems to me they they're using the professional um, referees as touch judges okay. as well as being centre men, and so I think that uh, you know there's a sort of hybrid way of of adjudicating the game and trying to get it right. Is there any other rules in today's game that you think uh, need a change, or do you think just leave the game as the way it is? instead of introducing oh, mate, new rules? Whatever it was, a couple of years ago, um, I thought that was absolute madness, the number of, um, you know, rules and ways of adjudicating the game. Um, they made all at once. So yeah. it's just, I find, um, you know, personally, I find that way too many games are blown it, blowouts, and I think it's... It's very hard to work out why because they changed so many things at the one time. Yep. If they'd have changed one or two things and and gave it a, a run for a couple of years to see if it made a, a, a you know they got the desired result of whatever it is they were looking for in the you know whether it was entertainment or you know less injuries or whatever the 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 things that the, 
they they wanted to uh, see improved in the game. It's I just thought they just went you know too much all at the same time. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, definitely there was a, a lot of rule changes at once. Uh, now back to your uh, coaching and you coached St George in the early nineties. Uh, and one player and former guest on the podcast that was there in uh, 1991 was Martin Afire from England. Um, yeah. What what sort of an impact do you think Martin had on the team going into that 92 season? Because he was, as I said, the top try scorer for your club in 91. Yeah, no, he was only with us, uh, I think I'm correct. Um, he only had one part of a season with us. And... Um, I might I might be wrong, but um, I I do recall he had a you know an enormous effect on the with uh, Ricky Walford on the other wing. Okay, yeah. And the media were referring to him as the you know the black Porsches, and they they <laughs> really scored some fantastic tries. And Martin scored um, I think he scored two or three tries on his um, on his debut at the SCG. I think we played played the Roosters at. Um, at uh, St George, yeah, at the at the old uh, at the end of t- uh, the 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 um, S- Sydney Football Stadium. Yep. Oh, I might have been at the SCG. I just forget which uh, ones that what, which ground that was. But he uh, he had two others try scored, and I'm pretty sure with today's technology, he might have had four or five on debut. Yeah. Wow. Uh, he was um yeah well, he's a outstanding you know try scorer with a real f- he, he had a real uh, sense of the of the of the game in terms of capitalising. He just his anticipation was fantastic in attack. Yeah, no, definitely a, a great player. Now, uh, unfortunately, you lost two grand finals in ninety two and ninety three to the to the Broncos, coached by Wayne Bennett. Um, do you look back now and think that one of those games, if not both, you should have won? Oh no, I'm pretty. I'm pretty happy that you know the um, the St George Club and, and in those days was you know we were operating on a completely different budget to as were most of the other teams compared yeah. to Brisbane. You know, at one stage I think Brisbane had 15 internationals yeah, definitely. in their on their roster, but you know the boys, um, the, the 1992 guys were um, that was a real slog for us. Um, to get there, and uh, you know, I thought I was really proud, and I think everyone associated with St George was proud of that. But '93, the follow-up year, um, was that was a disappointment, a, a real disappointment, because we'd we'd really in the last month of the season, I think the Bulldogs finished as minor premiers, and and, uh, and uh, the Canberra Raiders were uh, also up there. We beat those teams like twice. I think we played them late in the major competition and then yeah. the, in the playoff series as well in the semi-finals and so, and um, and uh, Brisbane had been really doing it tough and they scraped into the into the I think they finished fifth in the old okay, five, yeah, final five teams. Yeah. yes and they, they just beat us on courage really we we just had a bad day on the on the grand final day and you know that that that's one game, you know, out of all of the games I've coached, is is right up there with, you know, the probably because the stakes were so high. But yeah. we just had a had a really an off day. And when you have when a when a team, you know, when I whenever I coached the team that had a, you know, an off day with lots of players that didn't get near their best, you know, they were the days that I felt, you know, there was something wrong with. With what I'd done in preparation, okay. or in, or in within the game, within the game itself, and so you know that one always sits a bit, a bit hard in my, my mind to get uh, get past that. Yeah, well, um, do coaches have rivals like we have? Uh, we see teams, rival teams, and players have their rivals. Do, do coaches have any rivals? <laughs> like, did, did yeah. you have a rivalry with say Wayne Bennett or or Phil Gould uh, at the tour? No, mate. Because no. I think it was because of of uh, my, you know, the way I, I'd, I'd had to. I had no pedigree, you know. Okay. Yeah. I've been a reserve grade player in the main. I played twenty something games of first grade, and most of the guys, you know, that I was coaching against, I was, 
I was 29 when I first started and but every week for me was like a grand final as a as a you know with the with the Steelers it was just such hard work to to even get the the, the thing to be a, a competitive experience you know and to win was like I just had to work my socks off every week to yeah. make sure that we we got it you know we got it right so mate they were all my rivals all of them I ne- <laughs> didn't really like any of them <laughs> yeah that's fair enough uh before you coached the dragons you coached over in england um with hull fc uh and then after the dragons you coached bradford uh but also you also coached warrington as well later on did you enjoy your time coaching in, in england and is it different being a an english coach in the super league than to a nrl coach yeah well again this was before super league um went in my time at Hull and that was that was um, a, a sort of similar experience a, a, a former great old, old club that uh, was in a bit of a hole when they, uh, they, they picked on me to come and okay. and uh, set, set the record straight and get it going and it was it was fantastic the, the, the way that um, the, the, the fans are uh, much more uh, parochial and um, and really I love their their sport. They gave me a real impetus when I was there. I felt like I'd I'd really found a a lot more enjoyment in the game. It wasn't working so so hard. It was tough, but but it wasn't so hard as cutthroat as um sort of uh, footy was in the old Sydney comp at that stage. It was a wonderful experience. I had you know three years there it was absolutely awesome at um, at Hull and. And by the, at the end of the, my time at St George, uh, the five years I had there, I went to, uh, that was the sort of middle of the, or the beginning of the Super League, and I okay, coached yeah. there at Bradford Bulls with um, Matthew Elliott and quite a few other Aussie players uh, there as well. So that was a really uplifting experience because it sort of went from the absolute pits of a, you know, amateurly run um, club yeah. to a, a highly efficient entertainment machine. You know, we we got the place rocking. It was a really experience, a great experience there. Well, speaking of England, your son Rowan is doing pretty well over there at the Leeds Rhinos. How how proud yeah. as a dad? Do you, how <laughs> proud are you as a dad seeing him succeed in the Super League? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm very pleased that he's he's worked really hard as well. He's he's forty. 42 and he started when he was 18 as a coach so he's yeah. it's it's been a hard slog for him even to get a start i was i got pretty lucky as as a, as it turned out for me when i i started when i was 29 or 30 and he's um he's actually coaching against my brother tony is yep. tony co- is yep. coaching at my old club at at hull but uh, uh, Troy, I never had the pleasure. It's one of the few clubs I didn't get to coach at, mate. But I didn't coach at Warrington. Okay. Yep. Um. Uh, sorry, I just lost my way there. Um, returning to Australia after your Bradford stint, uh, you returned to the club that I love, the Parramatta Eels. Yep. How, how, and who got you there? And would Parramatta have been your first choice to when you came back to Australia? Uh, well, you know, I was contacted um, while I was uh, coaching at Bradford Bulls, and and you know, mate. To be quite honest, I'd always looked as a coach. I'd um, always looked with envy at um, at the Parramatta job. You know that okay. the club that club was, um, you know, in from a coaching point of view. I think most coaches dreamed of. Having the opportunity to coach at Parramatta is such, you know, a vast um, array of talent. Junior Junior League, um, you know, was always uh, the place where bucket loads of young players, you know, cut their their teeth and and yeah. made, made a, you know, a career out of playing professional footy at Para in the seventies, eighties, nineties. Not so much, probably the early 90s but so when i got that phone call mate that's a yeah there's a <laughs> didn't take too much talking for me to uh, 
you know, I, I got a release from my contract at uh, Bradford and came to start the um, the 97 season uh, for, with Para. Before the 97 season, the Canterbury Four came to Parramatta. Did you have any input into that at all, getting them to Parramatta? Or was no, that no, that was no. That they'd come. Uh, yeah, they they they'd had the ninety six season there. That's right. Yeah, when Super League had started. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when you did return ninety seven, Parramatta made the finals for the first time in a long time. Could mm-hmm. you could you then sense that something was building there slowly, seeing as though they made the finals? Oh yeah, yep, yep. It's um, you know we were we were a bit um, you know we weren't highly professional or you know it was a it was a tur- really turbulent time. Um, you know there were guys there that um, you know including myself who everybody had had massive pay rises. Yeah, because of the, all the money that was floating in the game, and it was a you know it was a some some of the guys took it um, as you know a, an opportunity to really turn themselves into professional sportsmen, and some other guys just took it as well, you know you gave me the money yeah. and I'll I'm just I never decided that I had to be professional. I'm just going to be as I've always been as a sort of player with a you know everybody until okay. 96 or so everybody was part-time yeah you know so some guys kept their jobs you know and they were picking up big six-figure numbers of, of with footy and not really you know trying to to move into a new era and that really that was a that was a tough gig for a quite a while there until you know some of the younger players that um you know, they were, they'd never had a job by the time, you know, got sort of 2000 and in the early 2000s. So yep. Those boys who came through our our um, junior rep program there, you know, the Kalises and Hindies and those guys, they, they never had a, a, you know, like a, we call it a proper job. <laughs> they, yep. they were professional footy players. So there was a big transition during that time. Uh, you mentioned Hindy there. Now, he's my favourite uh, Parramatta Eels player ever. Um, <laughs> he debuted in 98. Um, how how do you spot a potential first grader uh, to come in and make their debuts for first grade? I'm sorry? How, how, how do you pick a potential first grader to to come into first grade? Like, uh, it's just a, a, daily, a daily process, you know, or... Week by week, and uh, some of those guys were the first time, you know, that I saw them would be when um, um, our junior rep program was really well run, extremely well run, and and was the, you know, it was the place where it all began for lots of lots and lots of those guys that came through, and probably still are today. As far as I'm not really in touch with that nowadays, but. Um, you know, they played in – they before they got to play in the Harold Matthews, I think it was under-16s in those days, but they they come and do summer coaching school. So the, the young fellas were 14, you know, yep. and they'd come and, and start their, their, um, their climb to, you know, one day hopefully get to the, to the, the top of the tree and play for the – play for the Eels, hopefully, but plenty of them went to play with other clubs as well because that that um, junior programs was was so well run that, you know, we were producing players for other clubs as well as our own. Yeah, and um, Nathan says that uh, you're one of the smartest coaches that he's ever had and the best coach that he's ever had. Um, <laughs> well, he didn't have too many, you see. He stayed with the one club. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. What are your thoughts on Nathan and his, his career that oh, he had? Yeah, he says there's a little backstory to Nathan there that, uh, you know, the short version is that he would nearly, very nearly um, gave him the, the don't come Monday. At one stage we were wondering whether he was going to make it or not and 
he was a very shy kid and um and he was a bit a bit awkward you know i don't think he sort of found himself as a as a young fella he was still sort of growing up and not sure what he wanted in life but he we um i got a smart tip from um someone who knew him quite well and <laughs> and instead of um because he was such a you know he was a fairly big kid for his age yeah. and um we actually did the the opposite of of sending him away when the junior rep season finished we put him pretty quickly into reserve grade and as soon as he got with those you know guys that were were men yeah. his game instead of him being overwhelmed by it you know he, he actually really relished it and I, i'm from memory i think he played only played five games in um in uh, whatever it was the but reserve grade yeah so last cup whatever and um and we put him on the bench for first grade you know after those five games that he he really stood out and and I'm pretty sure that I'm not sure he's the if he's the only one that uh, falls into this category for me but I I I think he's the only player who I ever coached who came through the grades that never went back to play reserve grade. Okay, wow. He went into first grade and he just killed it. Yeah, stayed there and, and club record 330 first grade games. Yeah, and he, you know, without without ever having to go back for, you know, poor form or back from injury and have to start in reserve grade, that's a, you know, it's a pretty... Um, um, it, it depicts what he what he was, you know. He was just so determined um, to to do his best, and to, it was it was one of those guys who would, he he wanted not to lose yep. more than to win. You know, he was he, he played on fear that he didn't want to he didn't want to let anyone down himself or his teammates or the club, and you know he prepared himself so well to. To perform at his best, I think uh, one player in today's team, Parramatta team, is probably Clint Gutherson, who's a little bit like that as well. He he hates to lose as well, so he <laughs> wants to try and do everything to win. Yep. Now I've asked a few of the players who played in that uh, that dreaded game, the prelim final of nineteen ninety eight. Um, it's one of my least favourite Eels games ever. Uh, but in your opinion, what what happened in that game to lo- to lose it after you were ahead eighteen two with eleven minutes to go? Oh, yeah, cal- calamities, you know that. But um, that guy, I've watched that game over back in the day. I, don't, okay. I wouldn't have watched it since probably nineteen ninety nine. So <laughs> my memory's a bit um, a bit weary, uh, wobbly on that, but. Yep. Uh, yeah, just between um, absolutely diabolical um, refereeing decisions, and and you know we just our our playing um, style was um, you know we did we didn't get it right in that in that um, area. We just we needed to to not shut up shop. We needed to keep trying to continue to win. So. You know, that's down to me. Yeah, no, it was certainly one of those strange games. And prelims in 2000 and then a grand final in 2001. Uh, but before we get to the grand final, how do you build the team up from such a defeat like that in, in 98? Like, as I said, 18 to 11 minutes to go. Um, and then the 99 prelim final as well. How, do, how then do you build that team's confidence back up? After such devastating losses, no, oh, you just you just get back on the the horse and start your pre-season training, and you you deal with it, mate. And you you know you work at it. There's no you know there's no disgrace involved in that. People get uh, they, you know un- unless they um, have been in some sort of other business that I'm you know I'm not aware of. But in sport, you know that's 
it's what you got to do. You got to accept that sometimes you you don't you don't make the right decision, or you you know you just don't perform at your physical best for players on the field on the day. But you know if you if you um, get back on the horse and you get back to training and you you get yourself going again, you, your confidence comes from you know basically from hard work and and um, making sure that you you know you're developing the, the relationships with your teammates that you're not going to let each other down and all that sort of stuff, mate. It's not there's no secret great secrets to all of that. It's just if you're not prepared to do it, you know you shouldn't be there. If you've got a if you've got a um, a will to to um, get yourself yep. back in a winning situation and a winning mindset, you know, get get it right and you you know you get back to to winning ways. That's it. Well, just on that two thousand and one season, was that a mixture of your coaching and instinct by the players for the the tries that they did score and then setting the point scoring record that season? Yeah, well, that was culmination of you know from work from everybody, you know, probably before I was there, but definitely in my my time. You know, it started in nineteen ninety six in the pre season and in the summer, and uh, that was you know it was always the aim to to get there. And when you see the the names on the roster of the ninety seven team and. And, and then the, the guys that were in the 2001 team, you know, there weren't many of them left from the from the beginning. Yeah. So we got, you know, we got a a lot of those guys that I've been talking about that were in the um, in the summer coaching school, or the, in, certainly in the SG Ball and Harold Matthews uh, and um, and uh, P- Presidents Cup in those days, or the 21s or whatever it was at that stage. There were lots of them that had graduated to to get into that team, so they've been together for a for a um, quite a considerable time, and they became great mates. And you know, lots of them today are are, um, are still you know real close mates. Well, some of those players who played in '01 believe that 2005 was more of a better opportunity to to actually win the competition. Did, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think 2005 was a, a better team, so to speak? Yeah. Um, to be to be fair, I I really um, I think I've I, you know I got, I heard and um, reasonably soon after the game that that some of the guys felt that on reflection that they'd. Um, that they that they lost the game the night before when there had been so much publicity about St George playing West Tigers okay. and us yeah. playing the North Queensland Cowboys, and you know the, the that it was all over the the Dragons were going to get through and and we were going to play them we were going to get through and as it turned out we both lost and um, you know there was a a feeling of of um, somehow. They thought that you know their mindset wasn't right. So again, you know, I didn't really get that vibe on the day. So whether I missed it or whether it was, um, you know, whether it was, uh, uh, so it, it might have been the case for some players and not for others. I, I really don't know. But it was a really disappointing day that one as well. Yeah, unfortunately, it was. Uh... Uh, not not as for me personally as a Parramatta fan, it doesn't hurt as much as 01 and the '98 prelim, but it's certainly <laughs> right up there as as well. Anyway, uh, yeah, well, that's what that's what happens in you know in in playoff footy. The the hurt if you if you lose is um you know it's it's much much deeper than the, you know the further you go, the hurt. It's, it multiplies, you know, it's 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 hard to deal with and, you know, it takes a lot of courage to get over those things. That's right. That's, like, for me, watching semifinals every year, every every game in the semifinals is a is a grand final. I, I, it's on edge stuff all the time and, yeah, they, they are heart-wrenching losses when you do lose, but when you win, it's, it, it's good. Uh, 
a difficult ending to your time at Parramatta, but you ended at Parramatta as the longest standing coach in Parramatta's history at the time. Um, only a couple of weeks ago, Brad Arthur took over, and but having that uh, record is no doubt a proud achievement in your coaching history. Oh, a fantastic experience, mate. Yep, I met so many wonderful people. We, we had a fantastic group of um, staff that in the football office. Some of those people are some of the nicest, loveliest, hardest working people I've ever been associated with. It's just an absolute pleasure to, to, to be working there in those days. And uh, one of those people and good friend of the podcast is Hayden Knowles, and he says yep. he, he owes you a lot and you're a great man. And in in his opinion, he believes that you still have so much to offer. Um if he was heading up an NRL club, you would definitely be employed um, as <laughs> as clubs need mentors like you. What, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, he tells me that occasionally, and I tell him <laughs> that if he was in charge um, of uh, a, a footy club, he wouldn't be able to afford me. <laughs> no worries. Start saving then, Hayden, uh, and you may get the may get the job. But uh, yeah, start <laughs> no, saving. I'm only joking. <laughs> Um, I suppose, like uh, coaching Paravada, it's a, it's a tough gig as they haven't won a comp in 37 years, but I suppose that's a similar thing, coaching up at Newcastle, a, a proud rugby league town, and, and also no doubt the Roosters who are in the business to play and, and win competitions. Yeah, that was um, that was a very, very awkward and very tough, toughest gig I ever had. And, um, you know, Andrew Johns was... Uh, I think he played two games and and retired with an injury. And um, you know, I think the whole of Newcastle was stunned and um, it was it was difficult, very difficult. But uh, we, a couple of years, we got got it turned around and got them into a a um, you know a better footy club, and they had some some base to to play off and. Um, I, I quite enjoyed uh, Newcastle's a great place to live, but it's you know the footy was the, the tough part of the gig. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely um, very proud rugby league town, no doubt. Now you mentioned you watch a little bit of NRL these days. What, what are your thoughts on the game, uh, pros and cons of the game these days? Um, yeah, I can I can turn it over sometimes when I'm. Uh, Watching it, or you know, sometimes I I get the feel that there's um, it's a uh, it's, it's hard to uh, describe, but best my best chance is um, of describing it accurately is that uh, there's there's some games where I think that uh, neither team is trying to win; they're both just trying not to lose. Okay, yeah, and it. It uh, smacks a bit negative to me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, now that's fair enough. Um, there's also, you know, there's also some times on where I'm just completely amazed by the quality of the, you know, particularly the physical uh, physical aspects of the game, the, the, the you know, the contact and the, the, the skills of uh, that come out because of the fitness of our players and strength and, all that sort of stuff, and I, I think um, I think that uh, <laughs> the one rule that, um, apart from whoever was sitting around the table when they decided not to play unlimited tackles back in the mid '60s, yeah. uh, that that group of men <laughs> have never been, um, uh, as far as I know, they've never been congratulated for doing such, making uh, such a fantastic change to the game but not far off is something even simpler which is the rule relating to the, the corner post and uh, some of the tries that we're seeing scored nowadays are just out of this world oh, it's yeah. almost like a circus act it's um and some of the you know some of those wingers and and um, you know occasionally other guys i guess from other positions but that's um it's a it's made a hell of a change, a positive change, and made the game way more exciting as well. 
Oh, definitely. So, yeah, some of these tries that you see today are out of this world, and um, they definitely wouldn't have been allowed back in the day. And <laughs> I, I, I guess some of the no. old, the older players that played back in the day before the rule got changed would be pretty upset about that because they would yeah, have had more tries to their tally. I agree. Um, is there? Uh, what are your thoughts on this controversial hip drop tackle that we're seeing these days? Yeah. Um... There's uh, almost always, you know, the, the game's been always been very good at um, sort of uh, rectifying things, never being afraid to to um, uh, jump on things that need to be jumped on yeah. and eliminated uh, and, you know, other odds and ends about rule changes and stuff along the way, which I, I've, I've always really loved about rugby league. Um, but, you know, sometimes... It makes it a little more difficult for the referees to, um, to you know, to get decisions right, and um, you know sometimes it doesn't. It's so it's, every, anything that makes it easier for the referees um, is, goes down well with, with me, and anything that makes it harder, uh, you know, I think twice about whether it's worth the, you know, worth policing, but. Definitely around safety, I guess. Um, you know, the cannonball tackle that they, that some guys decided, you know, we're going to hit down below the knees. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know, those sorts of tackles. I guess this one is similar with um, sort of safety rules, safety uh, uh, in mind when they make those sort of rule changes or discretionary things for referees to police. Yeah, there's certainly a lot that the referees have to think about during a game, that's for sure. Uh, Very tough. Uh, who, who were some of the players that you really enjoyed coaching throughout your coaching career? Oh, just about all of them, mate, yeah. honestly. I don't like that, you know, the, who's the best one okay. and all that sort of stuff. I, I, I love guys that were, um, you know, really good team men. And I've got to say, you know, almost always... Um, I could say that you get get uh, players to play for each other is just you know it's a fantastic experience to be coach of that sort of that sort of group of people. Yeah, well, uh, most of if not all the ex Parramatta players that I've spoken to that you've coached, uh, they say that you're their favourite coach. So uh, that's got to be some sort of rap. Is there a player or <laughs> players you. you would have loved to have coached or had the opportunity to coach that you didn't? Oh um, uh, yeah, I don't. some days when they. When they're beating me, I wish I could <laughs> pull their jerseys off and change them over, but no, nah, not really. I, I don't kind of think that way, I don't think. No. Nah. Yeah, what about today's game? Is there a player that you'd love to coach in today's game? Oh, there's plenty now. I think there's a, as I'm not really you know, deeply associated anywhere um, with footy and um, not even with my brother or my, my son. Okay. You know, I, I, don't, I just don't ever get involved um, with, with anywhere. So it's, um, it's hard for me to, you know, to know what's – I'm just like everybody else, you know, the bird on the biscuit tin, they say. Yeah. You know, you, I'm, not, I'm not in it. I'm not in the game and I, I don't know, uh, the, you know, what's happening and I, most people should uh, – think before they speak when they're criticising things I and mean, they don't really know what's going on. Uh, yeah, nice advice there. Uh, now, you also did a little bit of uh, rep football coaching. You coached New South Wales country, um, also involved with the USA team at one stage, and you coached Thailand in a game as well. Is that something that <laughs> you would have liked to have do more of during your no. coaching career? No? No, no. I really wished I didn't do uh, the rep coaching thing didn't suit my my style, and you know I didn't really get any great pleasure out of it. It was it was a, a nice experience, but you know it wasn't not it wasn't a professional experience. Uh, I never coached the USA team. That was written in some um, document somewhere, and I don't know where that came from. And uh, a mate of mine is a um, an Aussie who lives in Thailand, and he asked me if I'd. Uh, Give him a 
hand uh, handing out the jerseys, and apparently that constitutes being a coach as well. Ah, okay, so, that fair enough. I I should have asked a former guest on the show, uh, James <laughs> um, James Tui. He the chair chairman of the Thailand Rugby League and plays at the moment as well. Um, yeah. and works at the Parramatta Eels, so he, he was there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, got some common common league questions that I sort of ask players, but I'll, I'll switch it around to a bit of a, a coaching style. Um, is there a favourite game that you coached throughout your career, one that you thought, oh, geez, I really love that game? Oh, wow. Got me there, Troy. Well, I know because there's like six hundred uh, over six hundred games that you coach in the NRL. <laughs> it's an amazing record. I, um, it's funny, you know. Um, just I don't know, but because I'm uh, I'm uh, aging, I guess somehow or other in my memory, I um, I've started to recall things out of my very first, you know, uh, well, New South Wales Rugby League game was at Leichhardt Oval yeah. and against, obviously against Balmain. And, um, you know, we, we were uh, tipped to run last in that season and, and that very first game shook everybody up because uh, the Tigers were a pretty good side in 1984. Okay, yep. And, uh, and, and it was this, the... Um, it was the the game was so uh, so tight and close, and we, we they nutted us, they beat us, but um, it was a sign of things to come. And we missed the we missed the playoff series um, at, in that season at uh, I think it was at Brookvale, the last game of the year, and Manly Manly beat us. We had to win to to make the playoff series. Okay. So you know that was um, the start of my my NRL career, and it's. It started to to run through my mind again. I started thinking about it after yeah. all these years, whatever it is, forty years ago or something, is it? Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, now it's always good to look back on uh, memories. That's for sure. Yeah. Now, like players, they have a favourite ground that they play at. Did Did you ever have a favourite ground that you coached at by any chance? By oh, SCG. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, terrible ground to watch. Okay. Yeah. Just, just for the history, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, very historic ground, that's for sure. It, it, was there a least favourite ground that you coached at? One that you hated going at? Maybe, uh, maybe you got uh, heckled out a bit. Oval, mate, back in the day. Yeah, but you were not only had the um, the terrible. Um, oh, well, that's that's playing days for me, but that um, the, the terrible surface. But you know, it was. Um, it was you. You were going to get smacked in all three grades if you weren't on your very best behaviour. <laughs> yeah. Um, and any regrets from your coaching career, or would you do it all again in a heartbeat? Oh, I do it all again. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Oh, mate, my life's been a just a dream. A dreamer. I, you know, just grew up as a. Uh, eldest child in a dairy farming family and um but you know you've taken me down the, the trip again today and it was you know just amazing that i i worked hard yeah you know i, I tried to you know to make a difference for everybody and i but regrets mate i i laugh when i hear all you know movie stars and people who were so they've got no regrets. My God, <laughs> I've never coached a team. You know, so many things that you do differently just with hindsight. But, yeah. you know, I don't have regrets in terms of, you know, doing too many things wrong or deliberately wrong or whatever. I feel like I made a difference to, um, and, I, and, and probably in answering that question you gave me before about, um, what I don't like about some of the games that I watch nowadays, I can honestly say that I never sent my team out thinking that we weren't going to win. Okay. Yeah. You know, we did everything I did, everything I could to uh, get them into a position where, you know, where they could win the game. And we played that way even on the days where we got a smack and 
Yeah, well, I mean, I've said that um, to to my uh, friends and that. I mean, players don't go out to lose games. They go out to win games. Um, they don't go out to deliberately lose games. That's for sure, mate. Yep, and sometimes you've got the right plan or, you know, you've got the, exactly the make the right manoeuvres and, and um, you know, combinations and the ball bounces your way and all that sort of stuff and, you know, it's, and some days it doesn't. So, you know, the, the key with, like, the essence of footy, I think people miss out on that, that they don't boil it down to, you know, like when a guy gets hit and tackled and put on the ground, he's got a choice. He can either lie there or he can get up and play the ball. And that's the motto of life, isn't it? Yeah. We all have to... You know, we all got sat on our bums at some stage about, you know, something that we, we wanted or have worked hard for, but it didn't work out right. And if you don't get up and get on with it and have another crack, well, that's not footy. Yeah, well, that's some pretty sage advice, that's for sure. Uh, definitely. Well, we'll wrap things up with the set of six questions, the, the personality questions, so to speak. Um <laughs> Is there a favourite sport outside of rugby league? Cricket. Yeah. Yep. Nah, that that's a good one. Uh, in the middle. Love of... the last cricket, the first cricket test. Oh yes. How on the Ashes. An, yeah. How good an ending was that? When you retired, mate, you, you can you know stay up and watch every ball. You don't have to go to work the next morning. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, what's the score in the series going to be? Oh, five nil, mate. Five oh, nil. Nice. Love it. Love it. Is there a favorite? What's your favorite holiday destination? Yamba. Okay. Yeah. That's where I live. Yeah. No. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, is there a famous person that you'd love to meet that you haven't met before and have a chat with? I met him. Who's that? Bill Walsh, uh, NFL co- head coach of the the Forty Niners. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which three former players wouldn't you want to be stuck on a deserted island with? <laughs> no, don't they? No, no, no fair it's probably it's probably be them not wanting to be there with me, mate. That'd be the problem. <laughs> no, fair enough. Uh, what's your specialty dish in the kitchen or on the barbecue? Oh, say that again. Uh, what's your special? What's your go-to in the kitchen or on the barbecue? What can you whip up? Oh, on the barbecue, I do the. I've got a secret recipe for um, um, barbecued chicken. Secret recipe, okay, nice, nice. Yeah, it's um, not very, not very complex, mate. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not much of a cook myself. So, um, and the last one, who's your favourite musician or, or band to listen to? Oh wow, geez, that's the toughest question. I love music. I, I've had music pumping since I was um, a kid in the, my parents bought a car and it had a radio in it and my old man gave me a whooping for sitting in the car listening to it when it wasn't running and the battery went flat <laughs> on the car. I've, I've loved music all my life, mate. I've just got uh, way too many, way too many uh, changes of, uh, you know, from almost from classical music in nowadays to put me to sleep or uh, rock, Led Zeppelin, you know, whatever. Ah, oh, nice. Stairway to Heaven, your favourite Led Zeppelin song? Oh, no, there's a thousand Led Zeppelin songs. Uh, yeah. I've never done the thing where you call, what do, you, what do they call it, the Zeppathon, where you, you get all their albums out and you play them one at a time over the weekend, like back to back to back to back to back yeah, to back. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, that, that'd be nice to do. Nice to do That's one day. That's a goal. Yeah? Before I die, mate. Okay, yeah. Nah, <laughs> that sounds good. Sounds good. Well, Brian Smith, thank you very much for joining me today on the Parrot podcast. Uh, as I said, it was an honour and a privilege to have you on, as I know that you don't do many of these. And I really enjoyed the chat, and you coached at the team that I love, the Parramatta Eels. So thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. Hey, Troy, can I say um, I'm a bit of a fan of yours and uh, your your uh, your program. And if I could, I just want to say um, uh, to you as well, I guess because you're, you've um, facilitated it, but for all the nice uh, 
uh, comments that you know mainly my ex players have um, expressed to you about uh, about me. I feel uh, really honoured by that, and I feel uh, I feel like I'm uh, just a little part of your program. Ah, oh, look, I thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, I really appreciate it, and you're welcome any time, and I, I probably could have spoken for longer, actually. Uh, well, we might have to catch up again later on. That'll be good. Thank you very much, Brian. Good on you, Troy. Well, welcome back, and thank you for listening to Brian Smith and his rugby league story. Look, there were some great stories in there. I hope I asked all the questions that you were wanting to hear him answer. Uh, As I said, I really appreciate uh, the time I got to spend with Brian on the phone and uh, have this interview. I hope you really enjoyed it. If you did, please leave it a five-star rating and review. Um, As I said, to have Brian as the 200th episode of the podcast, I'm pretty privileged and honoured to have that on there as the 200th. And I really appreciate Brian's kind words at the end of the podcast as well. So thank you very much, Brian, for coming on to the podcast. And I hope to catch up and chat again soon i really appreciate it thank you once again a quick shout out and thanks to jack's pale ale a fantastic major sponsor of the podcast for supporting the podcast you can get a jack's pale ale in the club shop which is purchased in the club shop i should say and it's perfect for that eels fan or beer lover So just drop into the club shop today and get yours. And also keep an eye on the social media channels for what's happening at Parramatta Leagues Club each and every week. Now, and Bo Cook from Loan Market, you can contact him on 0401 213 236. Get in contact with him for a free chat and see how he and his team can get help you get on top of your home loan and find you that best deal i know that from that personal experience myself so thank you both for helping amanda and myself out with our home loan and getting it sorted shannon cooney from glenwell park realty if you want that five star service from a five star real estate agent anytime, day or night, seven days a week, then contact Shannon on 0421 588 445. And if you are thinking of buying or selling in the Glenmore Park or the Penrith LGA areas, then Shannon is the man to call. As I said, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, get in contact with him. He is the man when it comes to real estate in those areas. So that number again, 0421 588 445. Also, BTZD Teamwear, head to www.btzd.com.au and check out their range of team sportswear and see what they can do for you also the Parramatta Times as well if you want to know the all the local Parramatta news just simply head to www.parramattatimes.com.au and thank you for being the official media partner of the podcast as well I hope you're really enjoying all this extra content each week, the radio chats on Pulse FM with the Duckman, the previews and the reviews of the NRL round. It's coming down to the business end of the season, so so some interesting chats there. Also the tipping podcast as well, I hope you're enjoying those ones. The game day previews, I hope you're enjoying those ones. Uh, I've had some great guests on previously, hoping to get some great ones on in the future. And, uh, yeah, the interview-style-based podcast as well. So if you have any thoughts on who you would like to see me interview for the podcast, then please just leave a comment or a review and uh or send me a message on social media and i'll see if i can get them on the show uh over the next few weeks so hopefully some exciting guests coming up as well for a chat on the podcast but i don't think it'll get much 
more exciting than the one with Brian Smith that you've just heard. I, I really, it, it took me a while, but we got there and I, I really enjoyed it. So thank you. I hope you did too. Look, have a great week as best you can. Enjoy your footy over the weekend. It's a massive weekend of rugby league, both the men's competition and the women's competition that starts up as well. So I hope you enjoy your footy. Be sure to follow the podcast on the social media channels for some interesting content and to see who is coming up, both on Instagram and Facebook as well. Give them a follow. And to sign off the show, and as I always say, the Paracave podcast, by the fan, for the fans. Go, Para! Thank you for listening to another episode of the Paracay Podcast. See you next time.